Jocelyn or say up here. If it's not y'all desperate, don't worry. Okay, Dominic, thank you. No, okay. Right. So should we be in the mode of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. For you have been kind, good to us, and you have seen us through all this whole week, oh Lord. We give you praise. We adore your holy name. As you have gathered this evening to be able to be impacted with knowledge and wisdom, we seek that your grace will guide us, lead us through this activity, that at the end of the day, we shall give you praise and glory and honor. We commit the resource person into your hands, that your grace will continue to be upon him, guide him and see him through as he says today's activity, so that all that... Hello? You miss me? Hello? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. But at the end of the day, we shall give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Um, we call on us. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. We call on our president, the president of Shanghai, uh, Salima to Yakubu, to give us the welcome address. And to give us the welcome address to Salima to if you are here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam MC, uh, for the opportunity. So it's a pleasure to warmly welcome everyone to the business seminar on behalf of Mix Shanghai and Nanjing Chapters. Please, I hope I can be heard. Yes, please, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, we know that times are hard for some of us in China now, and we are grateful for your presence despite their hardships. Uh, I hope the seminar gives us some great ideas to start our own businesses and investment plans. So, so let's give um, our speaker the attention as he takes us through this um, educational topic. I guarantee that our next few hours will be very, very memorable and uh, delightful. So thank you and let's pay attention to what the speaker has to give us. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam MC. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, before we proceed, can we unmute ourselves and welcome each other as uh, our president has given us a welcome address? If we can unmute ourselves and welcome, you see a friend, you just call the person's name and you welcome him or her to the program. Within some space of a minute, please let's welcome ourselves. Uh, Mimi, you are welcome. You said to. <laughs> anybody you see, welcome anybody. Uh, I see you, Francis. You are welcome. Is Tina here? Tina, you are welcome. Brown, Thank you are welcome. <laughs> please, let's please make the ourselves. speaker the host. We said that we should make the speaker the host that Dr. Frank is in. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the speaker is in. Okay, then we proceed. We, last on the list is acknowledgement of executive. So we invite Mad, uh, Faustina Brown to acknowledge the executives amongst us gracing this occasion. Faustina. Yeah, hello. Please, can I be heard? Yes, please. We can hear you. Okay. Good evening to everyone. Please, I would like to acknowledge the executives that we have in our midst. For News Shanghai, we have the president in the person of Ms. Salimatu Yakubu. We also have Mr. Kwame Ampofo, who is the vice president. We have Mr. Ernest Wilson, who is the secretary for News Shanghai. The finance, Mr. Luis Kwejo Apia is the financial secretary, and we have 
Miss Sandra, who is the Wukum. So for Nooks in Nigeria, we have Mr. Patrick Ejay, who is the president. We also have the vice president, who is Mr. Stephen Usei Apia. Miss Amanda Seiju is the secretary. And we have Miss Moj Novihoho is the, is the financial secretary. We also have the organizer in the person of Mr. Anthony Yeboah. Miss Rachel Hokua is the Wukom. And I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Miss Irene Koko, who is the national president. Mr. Selom Adade is the general secretary. And Mr. Seto Fujo, who is the organizer. I welcome everyone on this platform for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Faustina Brown. Thank you. And also, thank you for coming. Everybody who is here, all the attendees, thank you for coming. And we start our program. We, before we go into the main program, oh, we also have in our main, the national vice president, Mr. Thompson Enu Emmanuel. Please, you're welcome as well as the other national executives. I would like to give a brief introduction of our resource person. He is the person of Dr. Frank Boateng, and he is a chartered gold management accountant, a certified in qualitative risk management, a chartered manager and fellow of the chartered Management Institute in the UK. He is a chartered professional administrator and chartered management consultant with the Chartered Institute of Administrators and Management Consult, Consultant of Ghana. He is a member of the Institute of Directors Ghana. Dr. Boati holds a PhD in management from Walden University in Minnesota, USA and a Master of Philosophy in Business Consulting in Enterprise Risk Management from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana, and MBA in Finance from University of Leicester Business School in Leicester, UK, and a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration with Accounting Option from Central University Business School in Ghana. Our resource person has over 20 years experience in the extractive industry and has worked for Goldfields Ghana Limited, Newmont Gold Corp, Ken Ross Gold Mines and Adamus Resources Limited. He occupied positions from assistant accountant, senior mine accountant, accounts payable manager, senior business analyst, financial controller, finance and administration manager, commercial manager, and country managing director. He serves as advisor and board member to boards in Ghana and United States of America. Currently, Dr. Boateng is a co-founder and board chairman of Faith Montessori and Child Development Center a vibrant multicultural educational center esta established in Takwa. He is a vice dean at the Office of Research, Innovation and Consultancy, and also the HOD of the Management Studies Department of the University of Mines, Takwa, Mines and Technology, Takwa. He is also a council member of the Institute of Directors Ghana, board chairman and non-executive director of Ancobra West Rural Bank Limited. And lastly, he is a director of Breakwaters Associates, a firm of chartered accountants located in Kumasi. As you can see all these credentials, our, our resource person is a renowned it's a renowned expert in management and finance as well. So without further ado, I welcome our resource person, Dr. Frank Barton, to take the platform to educate us 
on how to manage, on how to start a business and also invest in our future financially. Mr. Boateng, sorry, Dr. Boateng. Please, you are warmly welcome. If you can hear me, you can take the platform. I can hear you. Um, thank, thank you very you. much, Madam MC and um, Lady President um, Salema to Yakubu and uh, my colleague Dominic, um, who found me here. I think I am excited, you know, to be here. Um, I always love it when I get the opportunity to speak to serious minds, uh, especially with how we can uh, move forward in a positive direction towards our own personal development, which will have a direct impact on the development of our country, Ghana. I know most of you are currently may not be in Ghana, but you have your roots. So we will always be relying on, you know, the, the, the knowledge you are getting to help come build our country. I will share uh, my slide with you. Okay, so um, I have a task to perform this evening and then this morning to those of us um, in Ghana. Um, you, you have merged two very important topics together, starting a business and making an investment plan. So you would make an investment plan and you would start a business out of the funds that you've set aside to start a business. So whichever way you look at it, you can also make a business and then begin to uh, invest your returns and put them into further investment and keep moving forward. So um, I, I'll be going through to get you to understand what business is. And then I will zoom in to uh, introduce you to some types of business or businesses we have around, not you know, in a very detailed uh, lecture about types of businesses, but for the purpose of um, what I want to deliver, I would you know, bring you closer to about four types of businesses. Uh, and then we will look at how to start a business. I will be speaking to you um, not from a lecturer point of view, but I'm, I'm also a practitioner. Uh, can we all mute? I am getting some feedback. Uh, John Peters or John Peter. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'll be speaking to you from a practitioner's point of view. So I am also a businessman and I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I understand the issues of um, business from practical point of view and also from theoretical point of view. Um, we will look at some of the risks associated with startups. Um, usually they say, um, when businesses start, let's say when 100 businesses start today, you give them five years, you can count up only 10 out of the 100 that will survive the next five years. What this means is the rate of startup failure is very, very high. And if we talk about what businesses and how to start business, then when you have the boldness or the fortitude to start, you would have to understand the risks and you would have to know how to, um, to deal with the risks that you'll be confronted with. And then we'll zoom into investment. I am very sure all of you know what investment is, but I would um, attempt to give you um, a broader perspective to investment. And we will look at some investment plans that you can take advantage of whilst you plan from now. 
and then we will take a quick look at the hierarchy of financial needs, um, which is carved from the American point of view, um, because you and I know uh, data is always, you know, an issue with Ghana. So most of the time, we we tend to pick. Please, please unmute yourself, please. Um. So so um. Dominic or, or Madam uh, President, what one of you can do is you can be muting people uh, for us once you have the the host right. When somebody, sometimes some of these things are done unconsciously. So if you see them, you can quickly help us with that so we can flow. Thank you very much. Okay, and sure. then we'll look at retirement crisis. Um, when I was researching and preparing, you know, to come deliver this, I chanced on a retirement crisis, um, which is just a summary of a research done in South Africa. And they talked about some of the mistakes we do um, when we start to work. At what age should we begin to invest? And usually what age do we naturally think we have to invest? And how does that impact on our retirement and the future? So it's good that at this time you understand all this so that you'll be able to, to shape and mold the building blocks towards your own future as you begin to um, invest. And then we'll take some Q&As um, 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 uh, from you. Usually I may not be able to give you everything, but from experience, both as a practitioner working you know, in the industry and moving to academia, I have seen so many things and I'll be able to talk about a lot of things. But most of the time, when you ask me questions, then I'll be able to give you very relevant examples that you know, will help you. So now, what is business? When we talk of business, we are saying that a business is an organization or enterprising entity engaged in basic commercial, industrial, or professional activity. So, I mean, for short, a business could be you selling mango. Um, a business could be you picking people's trash from their homes. A business could be you providing professional services in the form of um, trying to help people to even settle in China, trying to help people to um, connect to people, helping people to assess scholarships and other opportunities and charging them fees for all these services. You could classify all these as professional you know, services. Even setting yourself up to recruit students to come to China based on your experience and the opportunities you have, you link them to such opportunities and you could charge them fees for all these you know, services because they'll be deriving benefits from what you'll be doing to them. And all these you know, are business. So in a nutshell, you would have to make sure that any positive activity you would want to undertake, which complies with the laws of the country you're operating from. So if you're operating from China, you make sure that you are complying with Chinese laws, especially Chinese laws that concerns with setting up businesses and running businesses. If you come to Ghana, we will be looking at our Companies Act and all the um, uh, supporting um, legislative instruments that works with that. Again, business can be for profit and it can also be for not for profit. When a business is for profit, then the, the purpose for which you set up that business is for you to make profit. So when you make losses and you think you are in business, you must revise your notes because you, you didn't set out to be a not-for-profit. The not-for-profit are businesses that are not originally set out to make profit. So for them, they, they deliver service and value 
to other people to benefit. And most of these could be social enterprises, it could be NGOs and other activities that also rely on funding for their operations. You know, so you could set up a very beautiful social enterprise and your goal is to serve humanity and mankind. And you should be able to attract funding, grants to fund your activities. You know, I mean, by so doing, you could build up your own fees and other administrative charges that could be beneficial to you, but your focus is not for profit. And that is what you would, you would want to be seen as. Now, if you look at the business module that I have grafted into this, you could see that we're talking about competence, we're talking about product, we're talking about you know, partners and network, we're talking about marketing, we're talking about service, we're talking about management, target customers, cost distribution, and core values. When you set out to set up a business, these are the things that you should begin to think of. And don't forget that whatever you set out to do, it's, it, it starts from an idea generation point. So the ideation point of view is where you are looking at. You know, when I began, I started talking about certain services that you can provide. And mostly, this is where we have the difficulty. Most people are not able to creatively think in terms of what opportunities are available for them to establish business in to provide services or products within that space. So I'm, what I'm leaving you here on this slide is that we must all begin to identify problems. If you want to set out and become a very successful business person, don't look out for what is glorious and what is flourishing. Look out for problems. Look out for the things that people are rejecting. Look out for, for, for the lost opportunities that people have labeled. These are the things you, you have to look out to, right? That is why when, when um, Dr. Joseph Sienwe Japon, the Zoom lion man was doing his banking and he identified a need that a lot of people are making more trash and most of them will drop this trash in, 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 the, in the trunk of their cars and they will struggle to, 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 to throw them away he identified opportunities in the business of waste. And today, Zoom Lion is a very big story and a big opportunity that everybody is talking of. When, when Jeff Bezos was selling books and he felt that books were the opportunity that he has grabbed, he was able to identify the fact that books can be read in a soft form and how can we get into the space of not letting people buy hard books but they will buy a software that will connect to you know soft copies of books so they can buy on the internet and be able to read and keep reading more and this is what has established amazon today that is the top business you know i mean in the world and 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 the owner jeff bezos being the top you know, entrepreneur with the biggest um, 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 wealth, you know, all over, you know, the world. So we should always look at opportunities from the angle that nobody is looking at. From, we should look at these opportunities from problem angles. So let's say, you know, you guys are in, Shanghai, wherever you are, you have friends who have difficulty in even dealing with their groceries. You have friends who may have difficulties in doing their laundry. You know, you have friends who may have difficulties in, you know, I mean, simple processes like data processing, analysis, and, you know, what you can talk of. Just take advantage of these opportunities and make sure you make business within 
these angles. But let's not forget, let's always think and look at how we can create opportunities at a point that everybody is not, you know, really looking at. Now, if you come to Ghana, um, and I'm using the, the Ghana as, I mean, the context or the case of Ghana, because I know you're all Ghanaians here. Um, businesses take its strength from, from the Ghana's Companies Act 179 of 1963 which was recently, I mean, not recently, I mean, in 2019, revised between 1963 and 2019. I think if I say recently, I am not out of place. So now we have Act 2019, Act 992, which defines the context of business and how businesses can be formed in Ghana, functions of directors and every other aspect of business. So if you, from the context of that, we have certain types of businesses that we can consider. We have the limited liability company or companies. And if we talk about the limited liability, the word liability is cost debt, okay? And then limited means, I mean, what you are holding or what you are expected to take. So, if a company is, lim is a limited liability, what that means is in the case of winding off, winding off means when the company is liquidated or we are closing off the business, the cost associated with the business is limited to the directors of the business. It doesn't go beyond, okay? It does not go beyond. And if we even have a director who does not hold any guarantee to that limit? He, he doesn't have a problem, you know, I mean, I mean, when the company is winding off. So that is that. And then we have the sole proprietorship, which we call the one-man business or the enterprise. So this business is owned by one person and he takes his decisions alone and he takes his liabilities, he takes his risks, and everything involved with the business based on one person. It has its own advantages and it has its disadvantages. One of the advantages is that it helps in quick decision-making. So, I mean, unlike a limited liability company, which you would have um, directors of the businesses and you would want to go for board meetings to be able to take simple decisions, which of course it is not bad because the, 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 the practice of corporate governance works well in these kind of companies. And corporate governance is all talking about the, the, the proper formation and the foundation and operations of businesses, where there is respect, where there is responsibility, and where there is transparency and accountability from decision-making to expenditure and to um, um, being transparent from taxes to st all stakeholders that is associated with the business. Now, if it is a sole proprietorship, there is no such thing because decision is taken by the person who established the business and he owns the business and it is for him. So if he makes all his profit, he keeps all his money. The downside is that sometimes because they, they don't have any other persons to check them, control becomes an issue. And you would see that monies that are meant for further development of the business, he will use it to go and buy a land cruiser and ride in for everybody to see he has arrived. But if it is a limited liability with shareholders, with, with, with proper corporate governance structures and directors, you are dealing with budget. If it, you are not due for the land cruiser, you may be the person who started the business, but you can never have it because the business must come first. And there is separation, okay, between the owners of the business and the business itself. They are not the same persons. So for instance, if those of you who have been following um, the, the banking crisis in Ghana and then following the capital bank issue at the court, um, Atuesian, 
at one point said, this is my own business. And if this is my own business, why and how can I steal from my own business? He was wrong. He, Atuasian as a person, is different from Capital Bank as a business, though he started the business. Usually when you start a business, where you are, you are being given liquidity support from Bank of Ghana, what this means is they have control over the business. Your shareholders have control over the business. And the fact that you started it does not mean it's, it's your own company and you can milk it. So, I mean, I'm, I was just reading it this morning that the prosecutors are charging him that he, he took about 130 million Ghana CD or so from, you know, I mean, the bank onto himself and used it to establish another business, which is wrong. So let's understand that. Now, a sole proprietor does not have any of this. He can choose and pick and decide on what he intend to do. Now, let's look at cooperative. When we talk about cooperative, is where individuals with common interest come together, pool resources together, and they begin to unlend or lend these resources they have pulled together to support each other. So in Ghana, we will have the farmer cooperative. Even in the university that I'm working for, we have a, a cooperative credit union where workers subscribe to shares and they contribute a minimum amount of shareholding onto the, 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 the cooperative. And then there is, I mean, frequent contribution in, in form of savings. And these monies are consolidated and they are given to some individuals who may want to come in and seek for lending to go and start other business or to go and pay school fees and other, you know, I mean, um, activities. That is cooperative. And you guys can also do that. I mean, you are together. You, you are doing a few jobs here and there. You can pull resources together in a form of a cooperative so long as you can be truthful to yourself and you can have a, a good structures with strong leadership to guide you to do this. You pull these resources from, from initial contributions to constant, I mean, amounts that will go into the fund. And if you want to make any purchases or if you have any hustle to deal with, you could come in and borrow and then you will pay. So cooperative is extremely important. And this is also another form you know, of business. And then we have partnership. Partnership is an arrangement between two or more people. And partnerships can come in the form of equal contribution. So let's say if I come with you as partner and I put in 50% of the initial capital for the business, and you also put in 50% of the initial capital for the business, we are equal partners for the business. What this means is we will share profits that comes into the business equally, and we will share liabilities that comes into the business equally. So if we have losses, we share it equally, and we have gains, we share it equally. So you can also look at partnership. It goes beyond two persons. You can be five partners, and you, you, can, you can spread you know, the risk and the opportunities together and have everybody contributing to the quota in equal amounts so that you'll be able to pull resources to move uh, things forward. Now, let's look at, let's look at how to start a business. How to start a business. So you, you, you have now decided and you have moved beyond your ideation stage where you now have some solid plans and ideas to come out with a product or let's say a service. Throughout the process of thinking through, there are certain key things that you should concentrate on. The first one is what solution are you coming to provide? What solution are you coming to provide? And what problem are you coming to provide that solution for? Whether in the form of a service or a product. What is your work strategy? How do you intend to approach this? Have you done enough research on the market? 
And do you have enough information about your competitors? What goals are you setting that is going to help you work within the business plan you intend to put together to help you navigate through the ideas you have formed? What people are going to help you? Are you going to work in a team? Are you looking to develop a marketing team, a strong one? Are you looking to succeed? Have you cross-checked the ideas? And are you sure about the fact that, you know, that idea has been properly validated and you will be able to, to make sense of that idea? Are you equipped enough with leadership skills so that you can stand and move your team? Are you a service-oriented person? Do you intend to innovate? Is your product or service going to inspire people? What is your financial arrangement? Do you even understand how to set organizations up? And can you communicate your business and be able to make profit? So these are words that you must always think through when you put in the plan after the ideation stage to enable you to start a business. Because with, with, without this, you know, like for instance, without you thinking whether you want to have a product or provide a service, without you thinking and looking at the market itself and how you also intend to market to that same customers, without you having the strong leadership qualities that you can stand up and stand out for everybody to see you, forget it. Now, let's look at some of the risks. So they are saying that when you intend to start business, these are the things you must think of. And when you think about these, it makes you become extremely careful and you don't take hasty decisions that may land you into bigger troubles. They are saying that there is a possibility of you going bankrupt. And at least about 50% of people who start business go bankrupt. <laughs> this is very interesting. And don't, don't let this scare you. Um, um, because you know it now, okay? Most people don't know. And, and when I started my intro, I told you that if about 100 business starts today, for the next five years, we would have just about 10 of those businesses operating. And these are some of the pitfalls. So there is a possibility of going bankrupt. And it's easy because you see, when you start a business, you are so motivated and fixated on the, on the future. And sometimes you don't even think when you are pumping in the money. So think about that possibility. Know how you run your cash outflows and know how your cash inflows will work. Know how you have projected. Don't be in a rush. I will share an example with you, practical example. Um, somewhere in... 2014, I was in Houston, Texas, and I sold an idea to some businessmen who bought into the idea. And the idea was for us to start a sachet water company. You know, we're going to do sachet and bottling water, and we were going to do this with a different model from what, you know, I mean, at that time, um, Bell Aqua had emerged as the second biggest water producer, apart from, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the, the uh, bigger water in Ghana now, uh, Voltic. And Special Ice was at the teething stages and they were coming. So, when I sold this idea, our intention was to become a number three water producer in Ghana 
and to and to compete with the two major brands, which was Bell Aqua and Vortec at the time. I mean, it was a fantastic, you know, I mean, idea. And then, you know, the financiers threw in the necessary funding. When we were doing the business plan, and especially the cash flows, we estimated that when we start production, we will produce, let's say, 1,000 bags of water. And we had assumed that all that 1,000 bags will be purchased in day one. So day two, we will produce 1,000 and 1,000 will be purchased in day two. So up to seven days in the week, we would have produced 7,000. And we expect by Monday, equivalent in revenues of 7,000 products will be in our bank. And we have done other outflows from that projected income into payment of loans, payment of other commitments, electricity, and you know other things. Normally, that's what you would think and plan because you expect that they are products and the products will be sold. And I am not saying this because we had not done enough research and outreach programs on the market. We had done that. We had gone on the grounds, we had registered distributors and they were ready to pick our products to sell. And we followed all that strategy. But the question is, the water was new. Though we were doing adverts, we hadn't reached the vis visibility level that could give us the acceptance on the market so the products could be sold. So though the water had gone out and, and people were holding the waters, you know, our water in, in, in their you know, um, uh, kiosks and, and, and restaurants and all that, when people come and you give them the water, they will say, oh, we don't know this water. Give us what we have been drinking already give us what we've been drinking already. So projected 1,000 to be sold, we we're selling just about 400. And definitely this will affect the cash inflows, revenues. And you already have laid out your outflows based on an expected 1,000 sold revenue. So you see how this will not reconcile, you know, some of these things could lead you into going bankrupt if you are not very careful. And if you don't understand what I am telling you now, because you will be a victim and you would think, you would even curse God for you starting a business and why should that idea come to your mind and all that. So if you understand the building blocks right from the beginning, you will be able to build a bigger model because a lot of things happen when you start a business. You can go for one year and you are making losses. You are not even making a break even. So note this. Two, you, the risk of losing property or home, about 39 persons or percentage of people who start business, they lose their properties and it goes away. So for instance, you have used your house as a collateral to go for bank loan, to run this business, I am telling you, and you did not look at all the intricacies and issues that could reduce your expected cash inflows. What will happen is your, 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 your projected outflows in terms of your debt servicing at the bank will be hampered. And when you do not settle the loans, you are, the loan may go uh, delinquent. And then the problem you face is that the bank may be coming after you. The bank may, may put your house on foreclosure and, and they will sell it. So what it is is you would have taken money for the business, 
But because you have not really planned well, the business is not giving you the needed inflows. So you will service your ad flows and be able to have a seamless flow in running your business. They will, they will, they will put your house on auction and they will sell your house to defray the cost. Amazingly, when they sell the house, they don't even bring you back some of the money because you would have had a lot of um, accumulated interest, you know, plus your principal and, and the bank doesn't really care. They will sell it and go away. Again, we have irregular or not guaranteed income. That's about 30% of the people. And that one is very normal. Like for instance, um, the month of March, myself and my wife, we were not able to pay ourselves our monthly salary. The reason is that, I mean, we had to go source for other funding to pay salary. And, you know, one of the businesses we run, our payroll is about 70 persons at the end of every month, and we need to pay them. So if you have a lot of, you know, accounts receivable, where people are not paying you on time and they are all telling you we'll pay you month end, give us some small time to pay. You can go and tell your workers that the people are not paying me, so give me some small time and I'll pay your salary on the 15th of the following month. They have work, they have delivered. So you just have to go push your head in and go get money and come and pay them. And do you think that when I'm borrowing to pay my workers, I'll borrow to pay myself, who else will do that? So sometimes there is irregular, you know, or not guaranteed income that may come to you. If it is on temporary basis or on an ad hoc basis, like what we are doing, that is not a problem. But if constantly, a lot of people don't even know they have to build their payroll into what they are paying other people. And they shouldn't think that what is coming into their bank is all their money and what they should be looking at. No, run the business as the business and take yourself as a director who is working for the business and also getting paid for the work they are, they are, they are doing. At the end of the day, if you declare all profits, it's your money. You can reinvest it in another thing or, or you can do whatever you want to do with it, but don't fail to pay yourself. Don't deny yourself salary when you begin to set up your own jobs. There is also lack of job security. Lack of job security. The fact that you can lose your property, you can go bankrupt. Sometimes when you set out to start your own business and you are, that's the only thing you are doing. When you lose these things, you don't have any job. It is gone. You run from grace to grass and there is nothing there. Statistics showing that about 23% of all people that, you know, I mean, most people that start business, you know, have the potential if they do not run their affairs well, will lack job security and may be unemployed. There is also the possibility of suffering a personal failure. That's about 18%. What this means is, you know, sometimes we are so ambitious and we just want to fulfill our our, our, our goals. Like for instance, when you were growing up, you wanted to be a businessman or you wanted to own a certain business. Now with that feeling and that excitement, when you set up that business and you do not follow the building blocks and you fail, some people commit suicide because they think they are failure, they have failed in life and, and, and they should end their lives. Some also may leave, but forever they will continue to think that they are, they, they, I mean, they, they've, they've really failed and they have not been able to do what they sought to do for themselves. So this is also another thing that we, we should, you know, I mean, take notes, you know, of. And then we have the possibility, um, we have the need to devote too much time or energy to it. Trust me, sometimes Certain businesses will deny you from your family. You may not see your wife on time. You, you, you are exerting all energy on the business. And, and if you are not careful, 
it may also bring other problems into your 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 marriage into your um, your family your 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 paying attention to your children and and anything that goes with it and about 15 percent of the people that set up to set business have that uh, risks so note this risk note this risk and know how to deal with them when you set out to do business the next slide are certain risks with some measures that can help you you know deal with them like say for instance if you do not have the business skill for you to set up a business nothing is stopping you from getting some training today if you go to youtube any question you ask there will give you an answer so don't sit and and tell yourself i don't know this take a course get on coursera get some advice from an expert go to an agency that can provide you that support and you can come back strong with knowledge and move yourself forward there is also the risk of lack of knowledge of legal requirements that's all about knowing what the laws are so you don't put yourself into trouble competition is everywhere so if you think of business think about competition monitor decisions take actions you know i mean that will help you deal with your rivals positively okay do more research on your competitors and understand how they are doing their business and know how best you can do yours so you can be ahead of the competition there is risk of increased taxes and interest rates yes uh, if you have been following the news in ghana uh, there is e-levy that has just been signed 1.5 you know um the monetary rate was also you know changed which has the potential to increase lending rates and you know all that all these are things that can come at any point in time you have to know them you have to be ready and know how to adjust to be able to contain you know all these we also have changes in consumer taste yes of course i mean you know um if 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 you do so below and i drink every day and i'm your customer um be clever and and think that one day i may not drink just the sobolo so somebody may do may do sobolo and some peanuts as a complimentary you know service item i may have to go for that you know and leave just your sobolo or your sobolo does not even have the taste and the feel of some pineapples you know to make it very juicy and you just do direct sobolo with sugar and da 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 da, da. If somebody is giving me a blend of pineapple and ginger and all those stuff that comes with it, I may go for that. So people's taste and preferences change. And when their taste and preferences change, note that they will change from that product they are consuming from you. So constantly try to seek information, do market research, innovate around your products, let people get what they want whilst you take from them what you also want. And lastly, is technology. We, everything we do today, it's on technology or it's enabled by technology. How well are you training yourself? How well are you maintaining your technology level so that you will be relevant in your business? It's very, very important. Like now, everybody is doing e-commerce. You do not even know how to set up YouTube account you don't have an Instagram account, you don't have a Facebook account, you are not taking advantage of the new media, you know, to, to, to sell your ideas out there. You should be careful that you stay within every aspect of technology and make sure you take advantage of the technology wave. Now, let's look at investment. Investment. We are saying that investment is an asset acquired or invested into build wealth and save money from the hard earned income or appreciation so um this is a simple definition 
So investment primarily means um, to obtain an additional source of income or a gain of profit from the investment over a specific period of time. Now, I'm going to ask a simple question here. If you build a house, and I need an answer for that question. If you build a house and you live in that house, is that house an investment? Somebody can raise their hand and try to give me an answer. I just want to hear from you on this. Oh, nobody is speaking. Oh, you guys are not there. Um, okay. We are here. We are, here. <laughs> we are, oh, we are trying to think about it. May I answer? Yes, please, you can. I... For me, I think it's not an investment. It, it becomes an investment when you rent it out. Okay. That is the answer I'm looking for. But I am pretty sure most people may not understand it that way. Or they would try and argue that, yes, you bought blocks and cement. And everybody knows that, yeah, when you do this, uh, cement prices and iron rods are going up. So that, that very property will appreciate in value and blah, 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 that argument. Yes, we appreciate that argument too. But the fact is that if you look at the balance sheet, those of you who are familiar with it, balance sheet has asset column and liability column, right? What liability means, what liability means is that Anything that is not giving you return on investment is liability. And from this simple investment definition, and for which, I mean, I mean an investment is, is, is an asset class, and, and an investment is looking at any assets that would give you returns on your investment. So if you build a house, and your sole purpose for this house is to live in. Don't forget you are living in that house. You will paint it. You will maintain it. You would pay taxes on that house if um, uh, you live in abroad, which is now chasing at here. We pay property rate and you know all that. So these are all house taxes. So when you are paying all these monies and you are not getting any money from that property, then we attempted to call it a liability. But it's a good liability. I mean, we will look at some bad liabilities or bad debts and good debts. This is a good liability. Why is a good liability is that it is your own house. And if you, can, if you want to sell it anytime in the future, you will be able to have an appreciated value of that house. So it's a good liability. But in fact, is a liability. So what, what we, we usually would have to do is that as a young person coming up, always begin to grow more assets before you begin to add some liabilities. So if you have noticed, the most serious businessmen who truly understand these principles, they won't start out their business instantly by buying cars, especially private cars. And even when they begin to buy the private cars, they start slowly until they have gotten to a point that they now have more assets that will be able to cover liabilities. And then they will spend and buy their Ferrari and, 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 and those kinds of cars. Because sometimes, the, the, it is the value of the assets that is giving them so much returns that they need to spend on big ticket assets with big ticket liabilities, like buying a Ferrari or you know, any of those um, 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 high valued you know, vehicles. So 
this is what it is. So let's say you want to build a house, a younger person. Don't build your dream house when you are building just your first house. Our fathers and forefathers have made those mistakes. They build a house such that it is not even convertible when it becomes necessary for it to be rented. And you see a whole big house and only three persons are living in. And a young person who is setting out, instead of him to, to build one bedroom, two bedroom for young people to, to rent, so he can raise more revenue. And when he gets his second project on the third project, then he can begin to build some form of home he wants to live in. Even that with a convertible ideas in mind. You can, if, if I see, somebody who is under 50 years trying to build a dream house, that means the person has really covered more grounds and has enough assets that he can rely on to have that cozy life. So note this, note this, okay? Note this. Now, let's look at some few tips on setting up your budget. Few tips. Um, I have some young persons that um, um, uh, when they set out, so let's say when they leave campus and they finish their national service and they start work, they will call me, Doc, um, we are starting now. Um, what should we do? I mean, one guy called me and he said, oh, he got his first pay and he shared all the money and um, he didn't even keep some of the money. And I said, okay, that's good. So what are you going to do with the second pay? He said, oh, the second pay, what I intend to do is to also give it out. There are so many people who, you know, really need. And I said, oh, that is fine. But trust me, if this is how you are going to live, for the next 10 years, you, would have, you wouldn't be able to give the money again because you would have nothing to show. So you are going to earn money. You will need to determine your take home. That's step one. So you know how much you are taking home. And that money you are taking home is that net salary, which is coming into your bank account. Step two, you need to determine your savings contribution. Save from that money. Push some money aside. So what I told one of them who um, he was fortunate, he got a job with Google and um, I think they started him, a fresh graduate after service, um, they started him with um, $1,800, which is a very good money. So I, I told him, Send some, send, I mean, when the money comes, it comes in CD, so CD equivalent. When it comes, send a bit to your parents. Just, just you know, I mean, like 500 Ghana CD, you know, to them. Let them have this to support your other siblings. Take a bit of this money that will, will carry you throughout the month. And when you are done, just leave some small buffer in your account for emergency and push all this into savings. So do this for three months. The accumulated fund, take it and buy treasure bill as your immediate holding. So what you do is every other three months, you will double up your treasure bill. So every other three months, when they pay you your, your interest and your principal, you add the, the, the last three months to it, the last three months. So you go three months. So every three months, you are doubling up. If you do this continuously for 12 months, then begin to buy um, a plot. And we don't just buy any plot. Plot of land, it's about location, location, and location. That's one strategy. I mean, over time, research has shown that there is no place like a stupid place. 
There is a location in Accra, somewhere in 2002, when we wanted to buy plots. I thought it was too far, so I did not buy it. We came back after two years, just two years, that place was very close because I couldn't even get the plot at that place I rejected. And I had to take it at where they had traveled to and the plot. Now, you know, if I tell you how it pitches this and the value of the, of the, of the plot now, though it has property on it, it will marvel you. So it's two things. When you have the good cash, look for location, 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 and buy at the right location. So you can get quick you know, value addition within the shortest possible time. But if you don't have so much money, please don't worry about the location. Just buy it and, and, and secure it. Do the documentation, do some small dwarf walls on it and let the plot stay there. I bought some plot in Kaswa, around 3,500 Ghana CD. We held this plot for just four years and we sold it for almost 18,000 Ghana CD. Now you can do the maths and tell me that there is no investment on this planet that could give you that returns in four years. So land is key. Land is key. Now, I mean, your step three, you list your fixed expenses. I have gone through that. And then you have, if you have any variable expenses, calculate them and then make sure the remaining of the money at point five should go into an automatic. Sometimes you need to even sign a direct debit arrangement with your bank. So every month, they will take the money away from your account without notifying you. Sometimes you do that. If you are somebody who can be disciplined or discipline yourself to make sure you are consistent with your savings, sign on a debit you know, arrangement and let them take that money away from your account. The interesting thing is that when the money sits in your account, you chop it. And when the money leaves your account, you won't die. So choose between the two. When you leave the money in your account, you will chop it. When the money leave your account, you will not die. So choose between the two and decide on how you intend to proceed. Now let's look at some typical categories of debt, good debt and then bad you know, debt. If you take an investment loan, so let's say you, you've been able to um, identify some restaurant. And, and, and let me tell you guys, for the, for the ladies who can even cook and cook well, Ghanaian meals in China, you can do and package meals and sell to your colleagues. You do the shitos and the apreprensa and those Ghanaian meals they hardly get to eat. You can actually do them, you know, and sell. So food production is one area that there is, there, is, there is less risk and there is huge opportunity to make more returns. For instance, if you, if you, if you do fried rice in the, in the evening and sell to people, I mean, if you are at a good location every evening, you can save 300 Ghana city because you just buy the rice and you mix stuff together and you addition them out and selling. You will be able you know, to do this. I have, um, I had a friend who was or is a medical uh, doctor. And then she decided that she'll go into food production, food production. So she picked up loan and decided to site food joints at popular bus stops in Kumase. So, so what she did was she looked out for young ladies who had just graduated from the polytechnic with their catering stroke one stroke two. And she positioned each of them at the four joints that she had established. Okay, with, with, with some small 
I mean, loan capital for them to stack up. And these people were just there in their cages, selling, you know, I mean, uh, fried rice and stuff in the evenings to people, right? At some point, the, the returns she was getting from the investment every month was more than the salary she was earning as a medical doctor. And this is how we should begin to think. She's, she's a medical doctor. She's not a caterer. So sometimes it is not only when you are in that field that you can, you can, you can get into that space and be able to make you know, good business and good money out of it. No. Sometimes even the fact that you love food, food, you love food, you can get into the food value chain and be able to make monies out of it. So if she had taken investment loan into food production, you would call it not a bad uh, debt. It's a good debt. So investment loans are good debts. If you take a loan to buy home, home loans, they are good debts. If you take mortgages, they are good debts. The reason is that the, the value of the house will always appreciate. So if let's say at a point in time, you want to sell the house, you can get an added value and be able to, to pay back, you know, the, 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 the amount left on the loan repayment. Business loan, you know, I mean, uh, just as I explained the investment loan, but then typically with the investment loan, you are taking it to put into securitized ventures which will give you specific returns. Like um, um, you, you have gotten somebody who wants you to place a fixed income onto a particular you know, company or a coupon. And he has promised to pay you a specific amount over a period of time. Once you measure the returns on that investment and it is over and above what you are expected to pay at the end of your contracted period from securing that facility, it will not be a bad investment loans for you. And then a business loan would situate for um, um, my friend who invested in the food production. And then educational loan. You see, it is only here in Ghana that somebody will tell you, I want to go and do an MBA. I want to go and do this pro pro program abroad, but I, I, there is no loan. I, I, I no, no scholarship, and then I can't do that. And I can if you go to the United States of America, people take students loans to get education. People have taken student loans to get to Harvard. And by the time they came out from Harvard, the networking opportunities alone had paid off the loan. So I tell people that I will always choose between taking a loan to buy a car to, to, to compare to taking a loan to get education, I will go for the education. Because if I sacrifice and get the education today, I am adding value to myself and my price tag will go up. And when I'm getting good returns on that value I have added, it will be easy for me to acquire a car. A lot of people don't know. Most young people, instead of him to go and, 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 and get funding to complete that professional program, so he become a chartered in that specific field he wants to operate. He wants to drive a luxury car ahead of getting that qualifications that will push him ahead. So educational loan is a good loan. And I will advise any day, any time, if the opportunity is there for you to take it. Now let's look at some of the bad debts. Your credit card, you know, you spend it upfront before you pay. So sometimes you don't even think. You swipe, 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 and you are going. At the end of the month, you pay, 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 and you are crying. Most personal loans are spent on ourselves and they don't add any value you know, to us. And, and in Ghana now, you have payday loans. The banks will tell you, 
once your money land in your account, we can add three more of the same amount onto your account. And people don't really have the need and the use for that money, but they will go and take it. And you see, money is such that the moment it comes to you and you do not have plans for them, they will get plans for you to spend them. So if you don't have plans for loans, don't go for them. Because the moment the money gets into your hand, you may not have plans. The money itself will have plans for you to spend it. And then I've talked about the car loans. That one, I, I don't know how to express it. Now, let's look at the, I just brought in this, and as I indicated, um, we have problems with statistics. So most of the time we look for good examples to guide our students and our audience when we are delivering such seminars. So now if you look at the bottom, we have the, your cash flow and your basic needs are fitted into your food, your housing, your transportation and your daily expenses. So the fuel you are buying, which the price keep going up, your house expenses, including your electricity, your water, your cleaning costs, the food, and anything within. These are your basic needs. So when your cash flow in, you are feeding into your basic needs and you must be mindful of that. The second one is your financial safety. And if you remember, I told a young man to leave some small amount just for emergencies and push the rest into investment. Most of the time, these are emergency funds and sometimes people um, resort to insurance, you know, to help them deal with such risks. That's why in Ghana now, we have FINRA loans, you know, where you take these loans, uh, sorry, we have FINRA insurance, you pay small amounts to cover yourself, your spouses and your dependents in case of loss, they come in, you have your medical emergency loans and you know. So those monies that could deal with those financial security issues, you could resort to insure them and make sure you get cover for them. And they are saying that um, about 47% of adults would have enough savings to cover for only three months of expenses. So sometimes um, they will, people will have only three months. So in case of an emergency, let's say he's been made redundant, you know, um, where no severance was paid, this dude will not be able to survive beyond three months. That is your financial safety. So we have to be savings conscious if we truly want to invest more. And then... If you move to wealth accumulation or accumulating wealth, it is at this point that you are building investment portfolios where you are going to invest your monies, your treasure bills, your short term, your call accounts, your, um, your real estate contributions, and you know all that. You're also looking into your savings for retirement. So if you have a provident fund or a tier three, you are constantly paying and you have also created your own tier four for yourself where you are you know, making like the Ecobank Yee Fund and all this, you're pushing monies into them you know, to make sure that um, um, when, when the right time comes, you would have uh, enough money to fall on. And then you are also paying down your debts, which means if you had already secured a mortgage, you are paying down the debt on the mortgage on a slower basis. So that's how the wealth accumulation point is. And then when you want to truly have financial freedom, you are looking at where you have a long-term care. Your retirement savings has kicked in. You have educated your children very well. They have not, be, they have not become liabilities onto you. And you are able to take vacations. Yes, you are able to travel around the world. Um, we don't do that a lot in Ghana. We only very few people are on retirement and you see them. The last time I went to Disney, 
I saw older people more than younger people. And then I asked a question and they told me that these are all pensioners and this is how they are enjoying their pension. So they, they have come to Disney and I'm told most of them even retire, you know, um, and, and relocate close to uh, Disney. They, they get to uh, uh, Florida. So th this is how you would, you, you would truly want to say you have financial freedom because you've taken time to invest. And statistically, they say only 29% of Americans over 50 years feel very prepared for retirement or those who are able to have this financial freedom. And then the last one on the financial need um, hierarchy is legacy. Now, based on the solid foundations you have laid, you can now look at estate planning. You can now have tax planning and you have businesses that you, people will be succeeding you to continue with that business. And then this is where we call you built legacy. The man has built properties. The man has planned every aspect of his life very well. That lady has established the businesses and is going to pass on that to another generation, you know, to move on because you laid a solid foundation and you have left a very good legacy. Now we look at the last slide, which I got it from South Africa. That is the retirement crisis. You see, with this retirement crisis, it is looking at mistakes we make whilst we are working and the realities that stare at us. So statistically, they are saying that about 56% of the people start savings at the age 28, whilst the recommended age for savings is 23. I am begging you, if you are more than 23 years and you haven't kicked in your savings gear, then you are getting late. But it's better late than never. On average, about 70%, about 7 of people invest um, only 15% um, um, of their salary. I mean, how do you call it? Salary every year. Whilst 15% is needed. So, I mean, whatever you are earning, try as much as possible to push 15% into savings. You can do better than that, but minimum of 15% of whatever you are earning, you must push that into, into savings, accumulate them and lift it into better investment for better returns. It is, it is indicated that about 7% is what people keep away. And then 62% uh, of the people don't reinvest their retirement savings. So what it means is they think the monies are not accumulated enough. So they leave it you know, um, in, in their holding account and the money sits there. And then about 90% um, they don't even relook, relook at retirement savings after they have initially signed them up. So if you sign up, let's say the EPAC, the M-Fund, all your EcoBank staff and all your data bank staff and all that, when you sign them up, make sure you always go back and adjust it forward. Just as your salaries are increasing, you also increase what you are contributing for retirement. Most of the people don't do it. When they start a job and they sign up that thing, it's been there and it is just there. So you always follow up and make sure you have the right information and you have the right monies and they are in the right portfolio mix for you. About 38% of the people get professional advice um, um, the rest do not get any professional advice. They will not even attend seminars like this, you know, I mean, for knowledge. 
So it is always important that we seek out the things that we don't know. Just as the Bible says, lack of knowledge, my people will perish. So we should always seek knowledge and make sure we use the knowledge to our you know, advantage. So the mistakes and the realities on the right side is what is staring at you right now. And if you look at the bottom, it tells you what you need to retire comfortably with. It's talking about after working for 10 years, you need to have saved, um, how do you call it? Two times your annual salary. In this cryptocurrency. Uh, two times your annual salary, which is probably yeah, your 24 months pay. Yeah, so if you have really worked, if you have worked for, if you have worked for 10 crypto. years, start crypto and you lose money again. No, for crypto, it's not used. Are we Please? okay? Find the mute yourself if so, you are muted. So if you have if you have worked for 10 years, you should you should have a minimum of 24 months salary, which is kept somewhere. And it follows in that order. So five years will be 12 months salary, 10 years will be times two, that will be 24. 15 years, you know, on and on and on and on and on. If you work for 40 years, you are getting 12 times, you know, that. So that is what you need to know and you need to prepare yourself for. I thank you very much for giving me this audience and I will allow you to ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boateng. We are so grateful. Wow, that's a lot of wisdom on how to go about our finances and how to plan our future. If we did not hear anything at all, let's not forget that we need to identify problems in our communities and turn the problems to businesses. And also, when it comes to investment, as young people, young adults, let us get more assets rather than acquiring liabilities. Please, these are the take home messages I'm giving to us. Let us acquire more assets before acquiring liabilities. Thank you once again, Dr. Frank. Please, if you have any question, kindly raise up your hand and let's ask him our resource person is ready to answer every question that's bothering you. Is there anyone with a question? Can you raise up your hand? Is it that we did not understand the, the, the lecture or we are too satisfied with what he presented? I'm just being told that we have in our midst our Shanghai Provincial Coordinator in the person of Mr. Ato Kwamina. Please, you are welcome. And we have our National Wukom, Madam Millicent Aziku. And lastly, the past president of Nuk Shanghai, Mr. Ben Bafo. Please, you are all warmly welcome. We are waiting for our questions. Please let the question flow. Uh, DJ Atul, please, can you give us music? Yes, someone has hands up. Yeah, someone has someone hand up. Oh, really? Sorry. Please, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, Kofi. We have Kofi. Kofi, the okay. floor is yours. Ask anything you want to know. Thank you very much. Um, doctor, thank you for. Um, the lecture and um, all the advices you have given us as young people. Um, so one of the challenges we face uh, abroad is that uh, our families look up to us a lot. And for some of us, our parents are not even alive. And so we have to take care of our siblings and a lot of money goes into that. So for, for, for those of us in that category, what advice do you have for us 
regarding saving of our, our little monies that we get here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Kofi, I, I, I share with you, it's always um, um, a struggle when you are setting out for life. And just as when you are, you are, you start picking up adulthood responsibilities. It is always difficult. And I am a victim of what, you know, I mean, you are saying. I happen to be the firstborn and I looked after all my siblings. Even at some point, I, I didn't want to, and it actually delayed you taking your first degree because you had to quickly move on to start work and take care of the people behind you. But somebody told me, one elderly man told me, I mean, the early times, he said, Frank, you know what? It's good you are doing everything you are doing. But if you are not very careful, all the people you are helping will tomorrow become a very important person. And one thing people don't remember is that when you add value into people's life and they become very successful, it is good to thank God that God has been merciful unto them and they have been successful. But when they do that, they should also remember that God used a human being in doing that. But that aspect is always missing. They don't remember. So the only caution I will give is do what you can, but don't forget to build your own life. Because people can always come back and tell you, hey, then they have forgotten that you, you, you invested the money in them. And they can easily say it. So please do what you can but build your own life based on the conversations we have had. Do what you can, but don't forget to build your own life. I think this makes some sense, Kofi. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. No, please, that. There's a question here for you and from, okay. from the audience. I know. I'm really dog. What's your view on fixed deposits? Looking at the fact that these don't give much interest unless you invest a lot. Even okay. with trade, even with the treasury bonds, though those are safer investments. Okay. Thank you very much for that question. I, I always look at fixed deposits and treasury bills, call accounts as short-term investments, right? Never use these as your medium or long-term investment. So if you do fixed deposit or T-bill, you are only doing this to accumulate the fund, right? Do it to accumulate the fund. When you have accumulated the fund, move them into other um, 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 high yielding, you know, investments that you can bear the risk. Okay, so never put all your monies in fixed deposits. They don't give much, and even in treasury bills, they don't give much. But when you, you but they are the short term gaps for you to be able to accumulate, you know, your immediate funds for anything that you intend, you know, to do. I hope that's clear. I have Thompson, and then I'll come to Asida. Yes, please. Yes, Thompson. So, Thompson. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Doug, for the amazing presentation. Um, Doug, I have a question and um, a, a suggestion. All right. Um, my my question is um, is based on the fact that of of if. We all know that there's a huge gap between our education system back home and that of the corporate environment or the corporate world where mm -hmm. uh, business operates. We are privileged to have you today to present this to us. In our education back home as a lecturer, 
how are we bridging this gap? Okay. Okay. Can I attempt that? Yes. Okay. That's a very good point, Thompson. Um, I keep saying that there are two very important things that is needed for life. But unfortunately, those two very important things are not taught in any of our syllables from class one to PhD. The first one is how to marry. And the second one is how to look for money and how to, you know, I mean, uh, invest and how to be able to have financial, you know, literacy and become more proficient in the management of your finances. Nobody teaches these two things. But Thompson, you bear with me that these are the two most important things that runs life, if you agree with me. So for some of us, um, um, Dominic will tell you, I have been with UMAT only five years. And if you tell you some of the things we are doing here and the kind of changes we have been lobbying on the background and, and we are getting new or modified uh, courses into our system. So in University of Mines and Technology right now, we have introduced financial literacy as a composite course at uh, I think level 200, that everybody is going to do this. Critical thinking and those things, everybody is going to do that because these are the things you need in the 21st century, right? So hopefully, you know, everybody will get to understand this and we'll add it into our curricula and make sure we educate people on some of these conversations we are having today so people can finish university and get into life with financial, sound financial knowledge and they will be able to know how to look for money, how to, how to make sure their monies work for them and how to be able to multiply their investments and assets. So yes, I mean, that's your question. I think we are doing something and hopefully we will get to where we want to get to. Okay, thank you, okay. Doc. Um, Aseda. I think, yeah, I think Aseda. Thompson, Thompson is coming back again. Let's let's hear Thompson and we'll go oh, to Aseda. Sorry, Thompson. Uh, okay, so that was that's my question and my suggestion. I don't know how feasible it is, but um, I think everywhere in the world, uh, we study too much during our undergraduate. And it's as if we are all studying to write exams. So I don't know, but I would suggest that at least uh, you being a lecturer, maybe we can think of, even if we can have a semester for programs that will bridge this gap between the corporate world and the education world, if it is internship, like, oh, if you get to your last semester, all that you need to do is your thesis and internship, mandatory internship in companies and other stuff. Uh, I'm thinking that that would, that would be better so that people uh, will find it easy uh, when they find themselves in the corporate world. Because most people, they will go to school all the way to doctorate degree and they don't even know how to respond to email, which is very, is, is, it's very terrible. So, 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 Thompson, if you have anybody who is looking for sound university education in Ghana, let them come to you, Matt. I see. Everything, every, everything you are saying is what we are doing. Mandatory <laughs> <laughs> internships. We are even doing, we call it practical engineering. We have, we are mm. just starting that. Where people need to go to the fitting shops and, and go and learn how to use their hand to do practical stuff. Because people finish electrical engineering and sometimes they don't even know how to use the meter, you know, to, to take voltage and, you know, a whole lot of stuff, but they can calculate anything you want. So if you are looking for a holistic engineering education, come to University of Mines and Technology. Tell everybody you know in Ghana. <laughs> that is what we are doing. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Thanks. You must. 
Hello, Asida. Okay. Ha Hello, Doc. Hello. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, Doc, thank you very much for your time and your suggestion. Uh, mine is a question to, I think one thing I've realized is when people are in school, everyone has this mind of, I am leaving school and going out to look for a job and work in a corporate institution. Mm -hmm. My question is, Doc, how best can you advise those of us, some of us, who wouldn't want to leave school or who would want to start something on their own, be risk takers? You know, Doc, when it comes to investment, like you said, we have short term, medium term and long term and it's always those who can risk that goes into long-term investment and one thing i've realized about us as Ghanaians is about most people fear to invest in shares because they see it as a risk and they don't want to go into that aspect of investment so what advice can you give to those who are not going into the former sector, but the informal sector, they want to start something for themselves. Okay. I think- What they can do mm -hmm. to- Right. Thank to you. To be Thank able you. to create a good future for themselves when it comes to investment. Okay. Thank you. I mean, your questions are in two. Um, I'll pick it from those who want to start something by themselves and those who want to invest and shares um, a bit that you mentioned. Now, look, we actually want people to begin to create businesses and create opportunities for themselves and other people. And, you know, if you come to my entrepreneurship class, this is what I preach. I wish that about 50% of the people we are graduating will not finish national service and they will, they, will, they will write applications and walk around looking for jobs. But I wish that the skill that they have learned, the knowledge they have had, they will be able to start something. Look, I, I, I mentioned about a medical doctor who is selling food. And literally, it's not like she is standing out there and selling. And if even she is doing that, there is nothing wrong about that. So let's begin to look at what we have interest in or the things that we can do. Maybe probably um, you are in China. I mean, you could learn to braid the hair and at your leisure, you would braid the hair. I mean, you could start a YouTube channel which you will be able to sustain that channel and be able to generate some revenue to you. You will be able to provide some English class teaching for some Chinese students or family who want to learn English. And you can do that with dedication and make sure, you see, so there are so many things we can do. But as I said, let's begin to look out for problems. If you can't identify problems, then it will be very difficult for you to identify business opportunities. Let's look out for problems. And then we will begin to solve these problems. The easiest thing, food production. I beg. I mean, look, to the point now that eh, um, Jeff Bezos bought Whole Food. Whole Food. It's um, um, whole food. If you go to the US, whole food is food, uh, food sales shops. And if you go there, you can buy your groceries and go away. You know, Jeff Bezos bought whole food and he has moved whole food onto his, um, 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 how do you call it? Onto his Amazon network. So now you could buy ginger, onion, pepper online, and you get it delivered to you in less than 45 minutes, depending on your location. So what he's done is he's, he's map out the whole food locations. So when you make a purchase, they, they look at the closest whole food, 
and then they dispatch you know to you that's food everybody eats food so it's that is um, um how do you call it um, it's a low-hanging one that you know you can start with without investing in 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 any massive research food production so please let's begin to think let's begin to creatively look at how we can spot opportunities which are real problems and then we can solve them and make monies out of it i think dominic has his hand on uh, the second one you are talking about investment and you are talking about shares look um shares are long-term investments if you buy shares in a company you are looking to earn dividends at the end of every year usually dividends are not too big and you are looking for share appreciation so you want the value of the share to go up so let's say um we bought ecobank shares some time ago um at a value at the total value of the share was about 1000 uh, 100 or so, if I remember. I mean, today, that share value has appreciated. That 1,000 something has even gone to close to 11,000, right? The question is, if I knew, I would have purchased like 200,000 Ghana CD. I would have had a lot of money now. And it's just a matter of selling all the shares now, and I am, I am I'm strong. Okay, so shares are usually long term, and you may not know where the dynamics will be. This same Ecobank, when when yeah. this shares was doing very well, the the um, Ecobank development EDC, EDC. They, they they also floated some shares, which was even in dollars at that time. Giddy 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 giddy, and I spent three thousand five hundred US dollars to buy the shares. Today, as I'm talking to you, I think the value of the share is not even up to $800. So you see how it works. Uh -huh. so, so that's how you know it works. You can easily lose all your money in shares. And you sit down and the money will go to zero whilst you are watching it. And you can't go to anybody you know, unless you rush to go sell your shares. And sometimes if the shares are not doing well, if you even go to sell it, nobody buys it. And if nobody has bought the shares, they can't give you back your money. So let's understand the dynamics of shares and when we want to purchase it. I would never recommend to any young person to begin by buying shares into in, in companies. That is not something I would recommend for, but in your middle year that you think you are doing well in so many other aspects and you want to diversify your risk. You can push some monies into shares on a smaller basis and see how they trend. Let's take Dominic. I think we see Thompson again, and then we will take Sam. Okay, Doc. Thank you very much for your presentation. So, as you said, you, are, you will not advise the young ones buying shares. So, I want to see which investment package. As at now in Ghana, will be favorable for the young ones. Okay, so like I, just as I said, begin to accumulate your, your your fund. So let's say at the end of every month, make sure that minimum of fifteen percent is pushed into investment, and it's minimum. You can do fifty percent or eighty percent if you don't have a lot of responsibility. Save more money because you don't know when the responsibilities will start, right? So if you are doing beyond the 15% minimum, accumulate those funds. And when they get to an appreciable amount, get into treasure bill as the medium, short to medium. And then when they are, they are, they, when they are up enough that you could get a land, that is where I would tell you to go purchase and make sure you get the right documentation. I mean, research have shown, and I have in my in my delivery, I gave my personal you know examples, you know, and 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 one another low-hanging fruit activity you can go in is farming now. 
especially livestock. A lot of people are chewing a lot of pork these days. And, and, and people who are rearing pork are really making good monies because every Friday, every joint is selling, you know, I mean, yam and pork. So imagine you have your yam farm and you have your pork farm, your pig farm. Are you guys there? Yes, please, we are here. Yes. So, so um, Dominic, look at, look at these uh, opportunities as well. And trust me, I mean, you, you, you will not throw the money away. Okay. Let's take, Thompson let's take, is back again. Yeah, Thompson is back, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, I just want to make the um, last contribution then uh, I'm gone. Um, when Doc, you had, you, uh, you were talking, you made mention of, you made, you cited the example of, for instance, those of us in China, like if you know you can cook well, you can even cook some of the local food and, um, and sell it. It is a very good idea. But uh, to some of us, we are, who are going to start a new business and other stuff. Um, um, what I've learned is that let us not focus much on making money out of business, but rather impacting life first. If you look at impacting life, money will come later. So for instance, this food thing, if you look at, okay, how best can I impact someone's life in terms of me selling this local food? That is when you realize that, oh, Luke's channel organizes programs. And in these programs, they, 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 they share food. So in order to impact or to contribute to Nukes China, I can talk to them and be like, you know what? I can cook very well or I do this thing. Hence, uh, I can help you do this. In this, you have not even discussed about money, but money will definitely come. So the point here is that if you are going to uh, set up a business, look at the problem and look at the solution um, that will impact the life of people and trust me that one will need you a lot of money hence don't focus too much about money that's uh, mind you, money. Thompson, um, that's a good point um i think you're really looking at um adding value and, and let the value addition that people will benefit should supersede your financial interest so don't focus too much on money, money, money when you are starting business. That's the point you want to make. But that also does not mean um, you are going to work for free or you are going to use your money to go buy the ingredients and you will come and supply, you know, um, uh, China nooks for them to eat for free. Um, you are not an NGO unless you set yourself up to be one. So, Let's be mindful that your focus must be you are adding value. So if even it's food you are creating, you want people to get the best of the food with right nutrition and you are doing it very well and you are charging competitively, okay? That's where your focus must be. Create value, share that value and add value to people when you are delivering and solving problems. But the focus must not only be on profit, profit, profit. I think that's what Thompson, you know, want to say. But he's not saying go and work for free. If you do that, you are an NGO. Let us know. And we'll call you to come and cook for us for free. Okay. I think Sam and they will take um, Eben and we'll be wrapping it up, I guess. Hello, Sam. Okay, if Sam is Hello, not ready, Sam. we can then take Eben. A... Yes. Yeah, Eben, good you evening. Can ask the question. Oh, okay, good evening. Um, um, uh, my, uh, Doc, Doc said uh, we should invite, inform people to come to their school. So it provoked my question. Over here in China, 
most of these universities are linked up to various industries. So you realize that even um, students writing theses and some of their projects, they are able to directly find problems and solutions within specific industries. That is able to even grant them job immediately after school because they were able to be able to link themselves, solve a particular problem, present it to those companies. They were bought in, and that is part of the progress in this country. So first yeah. of all, do they, uh, their school, for us to help them market, which specific industries they can point, like companies that, okay, University of this, this is linked up to this, this, um, these so, so, so industries. And uh, how many of your students have been able to do projects for those specific companies or industries that have impacted their life, granting them job security straight from school to those places in order for them to save a little and then later on um, become entrepreneurs or like we are okay. saying here. So what is your, your, your practical link between your school and the difference between your school and other schools? Because other than that, we are, we are generating a lot of graduates who are not linked up to any industries. They are just wondering about looking for application for employment and the rest. Thank you very much. Okay, Eben, um, that's a good question. Um, University of Mines, and, and, and let me make this disclaimer. Um, I, I was engaged to deliver to you guys specifically on a topic which I think I have delivered. Um, the statement I made about what UMAT is doing was as a result of a question that came. So I did not seek to promote my university. So note that that's not the purpose for which I am doing what I'm doing today. Now, the question you asked, UMAT is a mining related and uh, giving support to the allied industry as well. So we are doing petroleum, petrochemical, and we are doing natural gas with the oil and gas aspects. And when you come to mining, we are doing the full mining value chain. So from metallurgy or minerals engineering to mining engineering, to geology engineering, to geomatic engineering, to mechanical and electrical engineering, and to computer science and engineering. These are the things we are doing. And if you look at mining, if you come to Ghana, every problem, every mining related problem has been, has been solved by the university. Just a few weeks ago, our vice chancellor was appointed by the government to chair a committee that is, or that had just reviewed the safety, uh, mining safety in Ghana. And he presented that. So as far as industry and industry link is concerned, this is what we are doing. And again, I, I had you know, a unit in the university, which is institutional advancement. And my specific job is to use the triple helix to link university, government, and industry together. Okay, so um, I, I don't want to talk so much about this university I am working for. It is a public university owned by the government of Ghana but it is the best I have seen, you know, I mean, around. I have, I have studied, you read my profile, so I am exposed to um, both Ghana, the UK, and the United States of America training. And I think I like what I am seeing in UMAT and what we are doing here. So that is what I can tell. Um, um, I don't know if that is a good answer you want to hear. No, okay. Um... You, uh, Doc, you are allowed to boost a little of your university and your achievements. It, it, will, it, will, it will encourage some of us. I ask that because, hey, please. I ask that because just like you are saying, the mines, our mining companies, despite everything, 
are destroying most of our resources and uh, we are not benefiting really from it. So sometimes it, it raises concern for some of us that uh, our, uh, our institutions, are they really helping us? Um, are they really Henry, pressing? Sorry, mm -hmm. Nixon. Yes, sir. Eben. Yes, sir. Um, I don't want us to get into this conversation because it won't help any of us. You don't have a lot of information. So you are part of the people that think mining is not doing anything to this country. Okay. Just take your time from now. Follow the industry. Know the amount of tax contribution that um, government of Ghana gets from only new month alone. Only every year. You see, we have a problem as a country, right? Over a long period of time, we haven't, um, um, how do you call it? We haven't mapped revenues coming from mining and we have also not shown what we are using those monies for. And that is why I am one of the persons who were very outspoken about a Japa, which parliament never passed, right? So what happened is, the contribution from mining goes into the consolidated fund and we send all into consumption and the money is spent and gone. Okay, but when we were going to mortgage the royalties of our mineral resources, bringing bulk funds and we were going to charge government to tell us what they will use the money for and the money should specifically go to those projects. I tell you the story would have been different, but I mean, for political expedience and a whole lot of things, people understood it different way. I also blame the, the people that did the communication for the, the, the product and the whole thing, and that is it. Now, let me tell you, the, the, the Mineral Income Investment Fund Act, which is now collecting the royalties, is even now buying shares in mining companies in Ghana now. So look, the only thing we have in this country is mining and, and, and that understanding must be there. So government will get people who are knowledgeable in the area and will be able to get what is due to this country. And we are not doing that. I mean, we'll put people to even lead as ministers who may not even have the right understanding of the industry, though they have technical people that will help them. But if the leader is now going to be schooled how to help take decisions, how well can you get things going? I have spent over 20 years working in this industry. I know what is in there. Fortunately, I'm teaching in that same institution that teaches people to go back to that industry. And I truly understand it. So there's a lot of people who give such commentaries as you have made because they don't truly understand what happens. And I, 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 that is the problem we face. Because when, if you do not understand, you would say what you know. And that's why we are where we are. So okay. uh, unfortunately, that's what the story is. Take interest in this industry and see what is really happening. Mining is not just destroying um, um, the land. Anybody who does mining, that's it with the laws. The EPA will let them pawn, uh, bond, they will, they will be bonded to post monies. And people post sometimes as much as 12 million US dollars to indicate that how they are cutting the land. If they do not fail it as required by EPA, those monies are not given back to them. That's, that's what it is, the real mining. But people who are doing galamse and destroying our lands, that is illegal. And nobody would want people to do things out of their own way. And that is destroying our water bodies and everything you can think of. For that, it is a responsibility between you and I to make sure that do not happen. And government has a total control to also ensure that does not happen. Sometimes politicians do this and they find it difficult to crack the whip. And this is where we are, where we are. So let's not box all the problems into one and throw the baby out with the water. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you, Doc. Can you hear me uh, now? We have some questions also in the chat box. I would like to read one or two. Um, 
please uh, set want, wants to know if wants to know if you can give us some examples of long term investment plans. Examples of long term investment plans. I've talked about land acquisition. I've talked about real estate. I've talked about I'm talking about rubber plantation now. I've talked about going into farming, choosing specific interested products that can sell very fast. People are doing cashew. Uh, people are doing yam farming, maize farming. People are you know rearing pork, uh, pigs, and 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 all that. These are all good stuff that you can push money in. You can even do, you can do transport and make sure you, you've, 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 you've insured the vehicle and you put trackers on them to know where the vehicles are at any point in time. Can you hear me, please? Okay. okay, thank you. Um, Doc, please, can you make your PPT available for us? Yes, of course. I would let um, Dominic have it and um, he will okay. share it with Okay, thank you very much. And can last question, you? Sam, if you can hear us. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you now. Please yes, go ahead. Can hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, it appeared my network isn't wasn't helping. During Doc's presentation, Doc, you did mention that you advice people people borrow to educate themselves and that yes. i think is a good thing yes but one thing that has come to my notice mm -hmm. amongst with the youth is that due to self-identity most of us end up choosing courses that are not relevant to ourselves especially when we grow and we want to go into the the work the working environment so an instance where someone has educated him or herself to a certain level, maybe a master's degree level, and realizing that you know, what she or he studied was it going to be beneficial, at that point, will you advise that the person restart by way of going back to bachelor, doing bachelor's degree program, restart and take a different course that he thinks will be good for him or herself? And you then know, uh -huh. the second one, in that instance, what can you advise when it comes to career choices? I mean, first, the course to choose, and then how to build upon it in order to enhance yourself going into the working force, because some of us may end up choosing courses that may not be relevant or we may not be good at because we didn't have the guidance or the advice or we didn't know ourselves. So we end up choosing courses that are or wrong courses, for want of a better word, choosing wrong courses. But by realizing our second thought, will you advise that a person now seeing the different course he thinks he can pursue, that's going to be beneficial to him or herself. Will you advise the person go restart the education system and then uh, build upon that? Okay, let me let me see if I'll be able to get you. You see, um, taking a loan to go do, um, let me use the word, an irrelevant course mm. is the same as going to take a bank loan to go and marry. Sure. Yes. Um, you see, you, the moment you marry, you've added responsibilities to yourself. So you are bringing fresh responsibility and you already have a debt to settle. So, so that is it. That's why, that's why, that's the situation you put yourself. What you don't do is that, or what you need to do is to first and foremost, look at the market. Look at how the market is, is, is going, which areas are booming, and what can you add to what you have so that you can become relevant. I am a finance person, right? I have a PhD in management with concentration in accounting. Okay, I, that could have been enough for, for, for me to teach 
as a lecturer, but I have realized that, no, look, I have a lot of time on my hands. I can consult and I can also do um, other jobs in terms of uh, account preparation, et cetera. So I now need to sacrifice both time and financial resources to do two big professional examinations. So I am a chartered management you know, accountant, okay? I mean, chartered a global management accountant and the same time as the chartered management accountant. What these two means is I have a certificate that looks like a passport. I can travel to Canada and the moment I get there, I will switch to become a Canadian CPA and begin to work in Canada without writing any exam. If I go to the US, it's the same thing. If I go to the UK, I can even look for a job here in Ghana and move to the UK and go and work. So why will I spend so much money and time to do that? It is because it makes you more relevant and it gives you more opportunities. So if you are looking to take money to do, a, and I'm also a chartered accountant here in Ghana. If you are looking for money to do a course and you do not look at the market and do what is relevant and can give, give you immediate response, then it is like going to borrow to go marry. That's how I will place it. Don't do that. Take your time, understand the market, know what the times are. I mean, look, for instance, we are almost everything now is about analytics. So if you are an HR person, I am looking for you to be able to understand human resource analytics. So you have to hone on your, your computer skills, your basic programming skills, sharpen your mathematics and mathematics and statistical skills. So you'll be able to use human resource information systems that will help organizational decision-making. So if you go to take a course in this area, you are adding up your knowledge. You have gone to do psychology, or let's say you've gone to do any of the social science courses and you find out that law fits into what you are, you want to do and you spend money to go do law in addition to what you have, you are adding good value. And this is what I am talking of. Now your other question as to whether you should sometimes come back and start if you feel where you are going is not good. Look, in this age, this 21st century, it is every course is relevant. The guy doing dance and drama is not like what we used to think before, where there were no opportunities, you know, for them. Now we have dance groups that are performing everywhere and making good money. People who are doing theater, they are doing skits and they are building their YouTube, you know, channels and they are, they are advertising for people because you're Sheldon and, you know, all, I mean, uh, uh, um, Zion Felix and, you know, all these people. So now you really need to have your creative thinking cap up rather than even thinking that you want to go back and do another course. Yes, if somebody has promised, like, for instance, I'll give you an example. I know a man who is a top man managing one of the mining contract firms in Ghana. And then he has a niece who has done arts and, and UMAT is, 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 um, has been you know, approved by Ghana Education Service to do a flagship program they are starting. They are calling engineering to arts. So now we are bringing art students onto campus and we are teaching them one year basic engineering stuff, physics, chemistry, you know, within one year for them to be able to enroll into our engineering programs on the, on the following year as level 100 students. Are you getting me? Yeah. So, 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 and we have over 300 students that applied and I think they, uh, no, they're over 400. I think they've taken 300 or so who are all art students. And this guy I'm talking of wants their niece to come do this program so that she can get into mining engineering so that when she completes in four years, she can easily come in and continue from what he has been doing. 
So if that is the arrangement, then there is no problem getting the person to come back you know, and start. In this case, she hadn't already entered university. So it's like she would do a first degree for five years. That is not a problem. But if you have finished the degree completely and you feel there is a need and there is a strong market, look, you and I know. I mean, we have friends who completed first degree in arts here in Ghana and they move to the US and they are nurses. Don't you have friends or relatives who are nurses in the US? Sure. Yeah, why did they do that? Because they found nursing opportunity than the master's degree they are even holding in business administration. And that's what is making them money. And we have found some of such people who have become medical doctors as well. So it depends on your location, it depends on the situation, and it depends on your life choices. The rest is in your hands and you need to take that decision and take it carefully so that in the end, you will not regret that decision you are taking. I think we will end it here for today. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much, Dr. Boateng. We are so much grateful for your time, for your wisdom, and all the insights you've poured on us this evening. Um, sorry that we are behind time because we were unable to start. Um, we call on Mr. Patrick uh, J, Nigerian president to give us the closing remarks. All right, thank you very much for giving me the platform. Yeah, for the sake of time, I'll make it quick. Um, well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, national executives as well as other chapter executives for showing up for this program. Uh, your presence is duly acknowledged and welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to also congratulate the success of this collaboration between Shanghai and Nanjing. Uh, as we, are, we all bear witness, the program has been a success and we give glory to God. And once again, to the planning committee, I know that much uh, resources and time have been devoted for this program and we say God bless you and replenish all that you have lost. Now to our dear members, we've always been counting on you and today too, you have shown in your numbers and we really do appreciate your presence. Now to uh, dear Dr. Frank Boatin, uh, words alone cannot express how grateful we are. I believe all of us on this platform really do appreciate the informative uh, presentation you have given us uh, this evening. And in as such, um, our appreciation have been crammed all together in one citation. And I would like to read it to the hearing of all of us on the platform, as well as uh, the guest. So may I have um, the citation? All right, as the screen is still loading, I would like to read it from here, but I know that as I'm reading, uh, maybe the screen will show up. Uh, the National Union of Ghana Students, China, Citation of Appreciation. Uh, in recognition and appreciation of being an outstanding speaker of the seminar themed, starting a business and making an investment plan, held on Zoom on the 2nd of April, 2022. Nukes, Shanghai and Nanjing chapters hereby express their utmost appreciation and present the citation of honor to our noble speaker, Dr. Frank Boatin. Your presence and knowledge shared will go a long way toward assisting members in putting their new ideas and acquiring knowledge into practice, as well as efficiently investing and investing and managing their assets. The seminar was a huge success because of you, our prestigious speaker. 
We greatly appreciate your kind gesture of making yourself available and gracing us with your presence, time, and knowledge. Dr. Frank Boatin, may God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, we take the closing prayer from this Mark Sarkodi. Okay. Um, may we pray together. Father Lord, we give you glory. We praise and adore your holy name for what you have made us learn this evening. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the life of our big brother, uh, Dr. Boatin. We thank you, O oh Lord, for making him make time, O oh Lord, to share with us the wisdom, O oh Lord, that you granted unto him, the knowledge that you granted unto him. We pray that even as we have received today, Father Lord, we put what we have learned into action in the name of Jesus. In a legal way or means, O oh Lord, will we execute, O oh Lord, whatever be anything we have learned today. We pray that your wisdom, O oh Lord, be with your people, even as we sit down to identify problems in our communities, in our countries, and provide solutions in the name of Jesus Christ. Father Lord, we pray, O oh Lord, that there will be a day to come that, O oh Lord, we will be among, O oh Lord, people who are impacting positively, not only in the place that we do find ourselves, but, O oh Lord, the world as a whole. Thank you, O oh Lord, we give you glory and praise your holy name in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Uh, Doc, please, a quick one. Can we get your emails in case any of the participants wants to contact okay. you? Um, I'm putting it here for you. Everwarting28 at gmail.com. That's my private email. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, did, I, did I, Dominic, you have it? Yes. Uh, or everybody can see it? Yeah, everybody can see it. But I can, if they need it, I can, I can get it for them. Don't worry. Okay, so Dominic, we will take it from you. Thank yes, you. Yes, Thank you all participants for coming out in your numbers to support this program. Thank you, Nooks, China, Nooks Shanghai and Nooks Nanjing for organizing the program. God bless everyone and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night, thank you.